your supporters to refrain from attacking journalists, especially during electioneering, as we are in some few months to go. And also, how will you deal with your supporters who act in such a manner? The second question, Your Excellency, the media industry is currently facing serious financial distress. Some media houses are folded up and there are hints of imitant sales of state-owned media. What are your thoughts on selling the state-owned media and how would you help the media industry to overcome the financial distress if you are elected as president? Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you. So only the GJ gets to ask two questions, please. Order. We we'll take about six questions, then His Excellency would respond and come to you. I work with Afima FM in Kofuridi, the East Indian capital. My question is very simple and short. Is there anything you have disagreed with in this government as a vice president? Thank you. Last Sunday, and also reading your manifesto, and you're giving us an abridged version. When you go to the page 23 and 24, you are tackling the rising cost of living basically on four legs. Food, then you talk about transportation, you talk about housing and also electricity. Now on transportation, your solution is bringing in, one of your solutions is bringing in electric vehicles for public transport. And uh, last Sunday you did indicate that you are expecting about 100 of them before December. I have three questions on that. We know EV vehicles are mostly charged. We have public charging systems that we use to you know, power these buses to ply our roads. When we check the Energy Commission website as of this, this evening, we have only five public charging ports in the country, five. And two of them are actually for Porsche cars specifically. Then one at the total energy station at the Liberation Road. So between now and December, where are we building the charging port? Is it government building it or the source of fund? Is it a private sector or is it PPP? So that's my question one. Thank you. you have, then question you two. Have, you have, no, and I it. And I am not that. No, is, it, for, is it directly related to EV? Yes, it's the EV. Yes, it's the EV. To the others. And make it short. Okay. So still on the EV, we know that most of these charging ports for green mobility innovations, they must be powered with green energy. So are we already adding on to our energy mix, which is the brown? Making it counterproductive, or we build dedicated solar panels for this charging port. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I think we'll go to the this side before we come back. So what about us? Don't worry, we'll keep moving to every road. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Vice President. So throughout your campaign, I have noticed that you've been talking about. Uh, job creation and support for businesses. I've also uh, taken the pain to read all the 260 page uh, manifesto that you launched a week ago. And I see that uh, the golden thread in that manifesto is also the creation of jobs. But the young people in Ghana are asking, really, where would they find themselves in that uh, manifesto? How are you going to create jobs for the young people of this country? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, I think at this point, His Excellency will take the questions. And... Thank you very, very much. I think uh, those are pretty tough questions. Um, the first question by the Vice President of the GJA <clears throat> was on commitment to media freedom. Um, and I think that commitment is very absolute, I think. The, the press and, and the, I mean, people have fought and have lost their lives even to get press freedom or media freedom in this country. Um, a lot of the times we take it for granted, but I think that media freedom and, 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 and is so pivotal to the whole democratic exercise that we are embarked on. If you don't have media freedom, you you, you, you have a, a difficulty. I mean, that's, uh, the lack of media freedom is uh, characteristic 
of you know, societies which are more dictatorial. And I think one of the things about Ghana that everybody who comes here really appreciates uh, is the freedom of, of the media. We, you, we talk a lot on radio, TV, all day. And so I'm very committed to this because I'm uh, inherently someone who is very committed to democracy. And I don't think that anyone should attack a member of the press uh, for doing their job. And so we will totally be against that and uh, ask all our supporters they, to refrain absolutely from, from doing that because that undermines the very democracy that we, we, we are doing. Yeah. So I think that one is, is clear. Um, the issue of sterling state-owned media, I, I'm not aware that anything of that nature has come to cabinet, but should it come, there has to be a justification for it. We'll await any such um, thing that, that will come. I'm not uh, aware that there, there's a, a, a you know, proposal uh, to, to sell uh, a state-owned media, uh, but if it it comes, it has to be justified, and of course, a big decision like that will have to be undertaken with a lot of consultation of, of stakeholders. Um, the third question, yeah, third question is about what the former uh, president uh, supposed to have said uh, about me being an economic messiah supposedly, uh, who has failed. Um, sometimes I get a little surprised and, uh, and amazed uh, the former president when he talks about economic mismanagement because he should, he, he, he should know his own record. I mean, we don't all have short memories. We really don't all have short memories. His record in economic management, what he left us with in 2016, was an abysmal record. It's just an abysmal record. We had endured doom so for four years with all the destruction of industry and livelihoods that happened. People died because of doom so. Hospitals. The National Health Service was virtually collapsed. Remember, we are basically back to a cash and carry system. The National Ambulance Service was virtually dead. We had only maybe about 37 ambulances for the whole country. Unemployment as a result was very high. Agriculture, GDP growth had declined to 3.4%, 3.4%. Agricultural growth had declined to 2.9%. Of course, industry growth had collapsed because of dues. Unemployment was high, there was a freeze on public recruitment as a result. And the banking sector was virtually, was on the verge of collapse. We have, as a result, the cancellation of teacher training allowances, the cancellation of nursing training allowances. You had a three-month pay policy for teachers, work for three years and be paid. And many children could not attend senior high school because of difficulties of paying fees and so on. You had many, many challenges that he left us with, you know. So when you juxtapose that record with what we have been able to do in these last eight years almost, it's really night and day. You know, we have created at least 2.1 million jobs. Uh, the latest number I saw was 2.3 
million. But let's say at least 2.1 million jobs in the last seven years. And this is hard data I'm talking about. 2.1 million jobs. We've kept the public sector workers employed and fully paid through the COVID pandemic. We didn't lay anybody off. And if you look at it, we built more roads, more roads, three times more the length of roads than what he did in office. We've built more railway than any other government in the Fourth Republic. Expanded rural telephony. There were 78 sites for rural telephony when we came in. Today there are 1,008 sites for rural telephony. We built more libraries, public libraries, than any other government. I mean, his time, he built only three, eight years, three public libraries, eight years. And we've built 54 public libraries in eight years. We've constructed about 12 major fish landing sites across the country. Xim, Dixco, Mori, Mamfol, Winneba, Senyabriko, Gomor, Fete. Teshi, Kusu, Ikumfi, and Fatsima. Constructed two fishing hubs in Elmina and Gamestown. Constructed more sanitation facilities, 817, than any other government in the fourth Republic. This has increased the proportion of the population with access to toilet facilities from 33% in 2016 to 80%. And 5,400 communities have been declared open defecation free. We built more sports facilities in Ghana than any other government in the Fourth Republic. Hmm. Whether you're talking about Botema, the University of Ghana, and so on. When we came into office, there were only three astrotefs in the whole of Ghana. The whole of Ghana. Three. Today, you have over 150. We've abolished the three-month pay policy, constructed 120 courts we're constructing. 80 have been completed with bungalows. Um, and we've kept the lights on live broadly in the last eight years. We've restored teacher and nurse training allowances, <coughs> increased the beneficiaries of scholarships, by 70%. And the national health insurance is now being extended to cover sickle cell patients with hydroxyurea, very expensive drug. I led the negotiations for that to happen. We have extended the national health insurance to cover childhood cancer, extended the national health insurance to cover kidney dialysis for over 60s and under 18s. We saved the deposits of 4.6 million bank depositors <coughs> who, who really um, were going to lose their deposits if those banks were not, were not saved. I don't understand whether the former president has taken his time to actually understand what happened in the banking sector. Some atrocious things happened. And this is why these banks had to be saved. They were not collapsed, they were merged into other banks. And we no <coughs> banking depositor lost one city. Everybody maintained that you had uh, very bad things happen. You know, some of the banks broke all the rules and extended loans way above the single obligor limits. They were given, in some cases, one billion CDs by the Bank of Ghana to help them get out of the mess. And they only got deeper into the mess. Another bank was giving capital to save the situation, it was giving money from the Bank of Ghana's Lender of Last Resort facility. And they used that money to go and set up Capital Bank instead of rescuing the problem that they had. 
they, went, they took the money from the center and went to set up another plan, which was also collapsed. Some took money and went and invested in private property. So, so it was against this background when the, the governor came to report, and this was one of the, the, my nightmares as in the last eight years. I couldn't sleep that night. That the banking system, our, most people didn't understand how close we were to a collapse of the entire banking system. But we were this close because all it would have taken was for a few depositors to go to UT Bank or UMT and they'll tell you there's no money. What would happen? There would have been a complete run on the banking system in Ghana. We would have lost, we would have collapsed the banking system. When the governor came to report that we were on the verge of collapse, decisions had to be taken to save the banking system and to save depositors. And this is how come we had to merge many of these banks into other banks. To see, and we saved 4.6 million depositors. I will ask the former president, if he hasn't read, to go and read the receiver's report. He made a statement and I said Ghana was the first country in Africa to have mobile money interoperability between banks and Momo accounts. Uh, some people decided to fact check me and they said that I was wrong. I guess that they didn't understand the, the, <laughs> the terrain, the fact checkers. So I took my time to explain to the fact checkers exactly what was happening in the field. Unfortunately, once they understood it, they didn't come back to withdraw. <laughs> they just kept quiet. You know, today, when chalk was a problem, Remember, chalk in our schools under the former president, when it was a problem. Today we have acquired tablets to give to the students. Every senior high school student is getting a tablet that we, we, we have. So I'm just putting some of these points together. You know, Agenda 111, so far we've built 47 hospitals, 428 chips compounds, 230 health centers. I mean, that is massive. That's excluding Agenda 1. Brought in drone delivery, and Ghana is now the whole world, the largest medical de drone delivery service in the whole world. We're leading uh, the world. The ambulance service, which was collapsing, we brought in one constituency, one ambulance, and we are making a lot of progress in that direction. So I think that, I mean, what is clear, I, I don't have to go through every sector. The data, for me, I speak only with data. The data is very, very clear that we have our government, we have outperformed the government of former President Muhammad in the management of the economy, in virtually every sector. Virtually every sector. You tell me whether it's GDP growth, whether it's per capita income, whether it is industry growth. I mean, virtually every sector we have performed. So he either does not read or he does not understand the data. He needs to do one of the two. Take his time to read the data and understand what it is before he comes out to speak, because he will speak out of ignorance. But if you understand the data, and I believe that as a former president, he does understand the data. He must understand the data. And I believe that is why he doesn't want to debate me. I believe so. That is why he doesn't want to debate me. He's, uh, he's running away from that. So if, according to him, our, we have mismanaged the economy in the midst of a global crisis, in the midst of a global crisis, if our mismanaged economy 
is outperforming you in virtually every sector. Yeah, I mean, let, let us settle this matter. And you are members of the press. You, you read the data. You follow the data. You know the data. You know that we have done better than him. So why does he want to come back? I mean, it's like you go for an exam with someone in school. You score 70%, they score 30%. And you want to convince people that they are better than you. It doesn't make sense in, the, in that sense. So I, I, I seriously believe that that statement, you know, uh, that we have failed. That of course, we've had challenges. Nobody can say we haven't had challenges. We have had challenges, serious challenges, challenges that have kept me up at night. In 2022, that was the horrible year for us, 2022. Petrol prices went up to 23 cities per liter. We were losing reserves so badly, you know, and you saw food prices going up and all of that. That was a real challenge that we had to deal with. And this is how we came up with the whole gold for oil, gold purchase program. And that has really helped us. Today, God, today, notwithstanding all the challenges, we are the 10th lowest price in terms of petroleum in Africa, the whole of Africa. Ghana is number 10 in those of lowest prices of petroleum products. We are number 10, 10th lowest. The lowest is Libya. Then you move through Egypt and Sudan and all of those to come to number 10, which is Ghana. Ghana, we are priced around 13, 14 cities per liter. Cote d'Ivoire is priced 23 cities per liter, as uh, Hassan was just telling me earlier on when I asked. You know, 10th lowest. Uh, we, are, we still want to bring it lower. But in 2022, at the time I announced the Gold for Oil program, and I said we had to attack this thing with Gold for Oil, the prices were 23 cities per meter at that time. So uh, we've had challenges. It's not, uh, everything is, is not where we want it to be. But I believe that we can work better. I don't think the former president can lecture on economic management. He just cannot. His record would not allow him to lecture us on economic management. Is there anything you have disagreed <laughs> with in this government? Uh, the issue um, when you sit in cabinet, you have collective responsibility. That is fundamental to government. When we sit in cabinet, we argue on many, many issues. And everybody brings their mind. And sometimes your view prevails, sometimes it doesn't prevail. But once we take a decision, it is a collective decision. And so I cannot come out and say that the decision that we collectively took, I disagree with. No, I'm bound by it. That is the nature of covenant responsibility. The question had to do with the rising cost of living, and I'm very happy you are raising these issues um, on the EV, electronic, uh, electric vehicles. Um, you're right, one of the ways that we want to reduce the cost of living is through bringing in public transportation, the electric buses. And, you know, so that is what is going on. We're bringing in about 100 to start with to essentially do the pilot for it. Um, and the issue that you raise is a very, very fundamental one, which is the charging stations for these electric buses. Uh, and I must tell you that Metro Mass uh, is working very, very hard as we speak. 
uh, to put in the charging stations. So we will have the charging stations in place uh, by the time uh, the buses get here. So that is clearly a very, very important one. Um, and the issue of green energy, um, whether you're going to, to try to bring in uh, solar to charge um, these batteries, I think it is definitely going to be important. Um, as, because in general, if you read that particular chapter, I want Ghana to move towards solar power. And this is where I think we should be going. And this is why I want us to bring in 2,000 megawatts of solar power uh, in the next four years to, to really bring down the cost of power. And um, you've seen some work already being done by Wei Power uh, in terms of the solar area, but we're going to really expand it. So in terms of all these buses, all these uh, government buildings, all the schools and so on, I want to move them all towards green energy, solar power, and I think that is where we should, we should be going. Um, I think that um, the, the other question was on job creation um, for the young people. I think that is at the heart of, of the manifesto, that you want to essentially um, move to create the environment and the, put in place the policies that will help business and that will help jobs. Right? So that's why we're talking about bold solutions for business and jobs. I think that is so critical. Uh, and I think that there are many areas that we are, we are touching on uh, for the young people to get the jobs. We, 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 I think that, I mean, the, the two are very linked, business and jobs. If you let businesses grow, then the jobs will also be created. And so we are looking at helping businesses grow um, by putting together, our, uh, implementing uh, our legally backed uh, Ghana First policy so that the procurement by the public will be focused on things that are produced in Ghana first before they look outside. <coughs> so that is a very important part of the, the, the policy mix that we are coming with. That will make people hire more and we will get uh, more jobs in, in that sense. Uh, we also have a major tax program um, that, of tax reform uh, to make the business environment very, very good uh, and easy to comply with. So we're bringing in a flat tax system uh, as exists in Estonia. Uh, we're, we're also bringing in a tax amnesty for business. Um, <laughs> so that we can all start on a clean slate and, and move forward. We believe that you know, training the youth will be very, very important. So the investment that we're making in TVET will continue. Um, the focus is setting up um, an open university with a focus on ICT, TVET, and also um, the, the, the whole STEM area as well. So we want to, to, to do that, but we also um, are trying to get our youth trained in digital skills. I have a program for one million youth to be trained in digital skills, um, uh, which is a broad area of training uh, for the youth, because the jobs these days are more, increasingly more in that space. And I think that we can have a situation where a lot of our youth are here and they are working whether in America or the US or Canada, uh, right from, from Ghana here and, and so on. So, so these are some of the areas that we think we're going to, 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 to get going, uh, the infrastructure area and so on, that will expand the economy uh, so that we can create more jobs for our, our people. And of course, setting up the SME bank, setting up you know the credit scoring system to allow people to get credit and move Ghana towards that system. Uh, we may have some time to talk more about some of these, but these are some of the areas we want to to get the youth uh, totally uh, involved and empowered to get jobs. Thank you very much. I'll take the next.
Yesterday. But at this point, yesterday we are going to tie the 